Hi everybody, Penn here with Yoga Sizes. I have Diana Bato here. She's she was originally from Jersey. She just recently moved, and um, we connected on the internet on Facebook. And um, I'm really excited to have her here. She's gonna share with her with us her experience in the yoga field, our Veda. Um, so thank you for being on with us today. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Um, so we'll get started on, let's share your experience, how you got started in your yoga journey and why you choose our Veda. And um, the, I saw on your website, you have a, a few um, offers about um, different programs or different offers. and. One of them is like about foot, foot, barefoot, something, right? Oh, barefoot and balanced. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's kind of weaving in uh, yoga and personal training. So doing personal training using only your body weight and not needing any tools like dumbbells or kettleballs or anything like that. So it's a more minimalist approach. You don't even need sneakers. You can do it in your bare feet. So that's awesome. But, All right. So Okay, um, let, let's begin with your journey. Like, when did you start with yoga? Why did you start doing yoga and when? Well, <laughs> so the story goes that uh, before beginning yoga, I was actually in the butcher trade. I was a butcher for seven years, and a friend came over one day because I had been speaking about the need to switch professions for my physical health because it's hard manual labor. So she came over one day and she literally threw a yoga journal magazine at me. She said, why don't you become a yoga teacher? And I picked it up and it was really appealing to me because I believe at the time on the cover was a picture of Patricia Walden in her white yoga tar looking, looking blissful and, and life. And I wanted some of that. I was very intense always on the go, working a million hours, and I knew I needed to balance out my life or burn out. So I opened it up and I was thumbing through the pages and I came across uh, Kripalu's training, the Kripalu Center in Lenox, Massachusetts. So it's pretty much known as probably the biggest holistic center in the United States. I went up there for the month long training in 2001 and I've been going ever since. So I guess I'm going into like 19 years or something like that. And then after starting yoga, the natural progression is to hear the word Ayurveda and be curious about that. And while I was not a health nut, so to speak, I was afraid of the side effects of prescription drugs. So when I stumbled on Ayurveda and I learned that it's very largely preventative and curative, but preventative, measures appeal to me so that I would hopefully not have to take prescription drugs and run into trouble with that. You know, Western medicine saves lives, but there's some caveats. And the nice thing about Ayurveda yoga is that they complement Western medicine really well. So no matter what your imbalance is, you can always implement something from yoga or Ayurveda really well. So um, when you teach, how do you structure your classes? My classes are geared toward the population in the room. And I have largely done small group or private classes over the years. I've taught in studios. I taught in the beginning in studios and then it just morphed mostly into my own home-based studio or going to my clients' homes and then still dabbling in workshops at studios and things like that. But I'll, you know, look at the population and teach according to what their needs are, their stage of life, their current imbalances, the time of year. So it's a more Ayurvedic approach and the tenets of Ayurveda are woven into the practice. So for instance, if it's summertime now, it's a very hot time of year, we'll do a more moderate practice uh, and focus on keeping things cool towards the end and then probably towards the end of summer, some more you know, detoxifying uh, interests taken there. So you mentioned detoxifying. What are the, some of the examples or um, methods or approach that you would use for detoxifying? 
Well, I would say to cool the summer heat or pitta, as we would call it in Ayurveda, you would focus on some twists and then uh, some side bending, more lateral type movements and cooling breath work and having a more diffusive gaze during your practice, not so intense. And, you know, like when you see people in warrior one or warrior two and you can see their the cohesiveness of their muscles, you know, they're really contracted and they're trying hard in a summer practice or really at any time, don't try too hard with your physical body and keep your, your gaze a little softer so that you don't, you know, perpetuate more heat in the body. We're trying to release it, not build it up. Um, so in terms of the, the different doshas, different constitutions, um, how can you, well, it would be, I'm thinking, how would you know like which yoga poses or which uh, sequence to do when you have a, a class full of people and they're with different constitutions? Right. Well, you can do, you can gear a practice to being pacifying for all constitutions. You know, there you can keep it neutral for everyone. And if your class isn't too big, you can call out individually to one person saying, you know, in this back bend, don't go too deeply. Or if you're going to really go into the back bend, try to focus on having your breath going into your container in a more lateral fashion to balance out the exciting heatingness of the back bend. Back bends tend to activate the sympathetic nervous system, but there's always a way to do what I call to, to MacGyver the situation, to finagle it, to work for you. So if you still really want to do that back bend, make sure your breathing is geared towards moving, you know, visualize it going side to side in your body. And that will help to balance out the excitement of the back bend. It'll bring it down. So you can always call out individual recommendations to people during class. And that's largely what I do. I shift on the fly. I have maybe a group of four people and one person's uh, spine can have a misalignment at the moment. The other person's just about to go to surgery for a new knee and they need to watch out what they're doing there. And I'll just give them all different directives. Okay. So it's more individualized client centered. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, yeah. As for um, diet wise, like for yourself or for your private clients, do you um, also work on that? Like your, your plan with them? How does that work? Is it like, <clears throat> Absolutely. When a person comes for a consultation, they'll fill out a couple of intake forms. One might look more like your typical Western intake with statistics like height and weight and uh, your previous medical history. And then the other intake form is the Ayurvedic approach. We ask you questions about bowel movements and uh, do you speak quickly or is your speech slow and succinct? And then from that, we can ascertain as to what your given constitution is, your prakruti. People, uh, a lay person might think of it as dosha. Dosha actually means that which is out of balance. So when you ask someone, what's your dosha? You're really asking them, what is your imbalance? If you wanna know what their born constitution is, you, we would say, what is your prakruti? Knowing your prakruti is important because then we have you know, a little headway into knowing where you're more inclined to go out of balance. For instance, I am a high pitta constitution person. So typically, if I look back historically, I would notice that my imbalances pop up more in summertime because if I'm already loaded with the heating element and then summer is very hot, it's going to raise that into an imbalance. It's like rolling, making a little snowball and rolling it into more snow, making it bigger. So heat and then adding heat will create imbalances unless you're careful and you balance it out with your diet and lifestyle. So the different constitutions, there are uh, three of them, right? And I think it's confusing for me at least as I'm trying to do the, the, the chart or somebody's um, questionnaire and then you'll get a number because now one person is like 100% one type. So there's like a mixture of the three, right? Some are higher, some are lower. Right. You'll, and, sell, 
you'll seldom find someone who's what we call monodoshic, although I'm sure it exists in the world. We're usually uh, an amalgam of the three types, vata, pitta, kapha. And you will also find dual doshic people, people who are predominant in just two. The way though I always emphasize for people to answer the intake form that I give is to, I, I really emphasize saying, answer the questions according to how you have been most of your life, not just currently. Like if I ask you, um, you know, about, for instance, again, I'm bringing up the bowel movements because a lot of it is about bowel movements. It's your digestion. And if, if the question asks, you know, do you suffer from constipation or are your bowel movements regular or are they slow and sluggish? Answer to how it's been most of your life, not just if you're all of a sudden experiencing constipation. Don't check off constipation. If you've been regular most of your life, check off regular. Then that will give that will determine what your prakruti is, your constitution, not your current state, your doshic imbalance, or your vikruti. Mm -hmm. And then we go from there. Okay. And then lifestyle, diet, like you're trying different things are gonna affect that. Absolutely. That you know, the way I was taught is the, the the mantra was always diet lifestyle are what get you into trouble and diet and lifestyle are what can get you out of trouble mm -hmm. you know we we can't take an approach like a, a western approach where if you have a problem you go to the doctor and you get a pill to take with ayurveda yes herbs are involved but you can't ignore the diet and lifestyle things that you're doing wrong and just take the herb and expect things to get better. You might see a little improvement in the beginning, but sooner or later, you'll, you'll hit a wall. You can't rob Peter to pay Paul and think it's going to work forever. So it's, it's about, you know, learning how to have a daily routine, a dinacharya that benefits your constitution, and then, of course, along the way, supports you to get back into balance if you're suffering from any imbalances. Speaking of daily routine, what's the um, standard, like typical majority of the people follow in terms of um, what's the best time to get up in the morning, what should be done in the morning, and follow that for people that work and don't work, and then what time is the best time to go to bed? Right. There are, there is a standard approach. And if someone comes to me and they're very out of balance and they're, you know, they just need to do something to start reeling it in. I offer what I call our bookends, just put a book end on each end and then we'll start to close it in. So for instance, that would uh, create an emphasis around going to bed at the proper time and rising at the proper time. Ayurveda tells us basically to really try to be in bed at 10 by the latest and then rise by six at the latest. Because as we know, you have certain circadian rhythms, your body wants to do certain things at certain times of the day. And if you're awake, even just lying there watching TV or reading, if you're awake, your body can't do the things it needs to do, like detoxify, burn off the bad fat and things like that while you're awake. It won't have the energy to do that. Or if you're eating late, instead of what I call the construction workers being over in your uh, liver and kidneys doing the detox, they're over in the you know, intestinal area digesting the food. So the detox and fat burn shuts down because there's nobody there doing it. They're all over in the intestines working on the food that you're putting in there late at night. So that's, that's a kiss of death, eating late at night, and then also snacking because you're piling food on top of food that you haven't even digested yet. So you're putting out your fire, right? That makes sense. And I've noticed when I do eat late at night, I feel more hungry in the morning. Yes. I, yeah. can, I can totally empathize with that. That's the same thing that happens to me. And if I eat early and light at night, I wake up more easily. I'm not groggy. I bop out of bed and I'm not hungry right away. Yeah. So, um, like, uh, in terms of um, different, like, things to to drink, like you got tea wise, um, is part of your part of the Arabic uh, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, Ayurveda loves ginger, ginger tea in the morning. That's a big recommendation we make because again, ginger gets your, your fire going, your, your Agni. And we say, honor your Agni 
get it started in the morning so that whatever you put into your container, you can work well with, you can digest and assimilate well. If there's no fire there to, to digest what you're putting in, you could put the most healthy food in your system, but it can still have a toxifying effect. It will get stuffed into the channels and systems of the body and, you know, just fester there and block your lymphatic system from working properly. So ginger tea is a great way to honor Agni and keep everything working well. So fresh chopped ginger. So for instance, what I'll do, one of my Dinacharya things is I pick a day where I do a lot of food prep, not cooking prep, because we don't like to eat food that's too old. So I'll prep a bunch of fresh ginger. I'll, I'll peel it if it's not organic. If it's organic, you can just leave the skin on, but I'll peel it, chop it in my little mini chopper and then store it in a, a glass bowl. And then every morning I'll just reach in the frib, fridge and grab you know a, a bunch of it, drop it in the pot, bring it to a boil and then just let it simmer for a few minutes and then have some fresh squeezed lemon and that nice ginger tea. Fresh ginger, anything in its least processed form is better. And uh, fresh ginger tends to be less, a little less on the heating drying side than the powdered ginger tea bag. But again, if you can't do fresh, do the tea bag. You know, you have to, it's always better. And, and for instance, if you can't eat food fresh every day, eating your old two day old food is still better than going out somewhere and getting poor quality food cooked by someone who's angry or something, you know? Um, speaking of ginger, I actually got uh, a, a bottle of ginger essential oil. What's your opinion on um, ingesting essential oil, like your lemon essential oil or ginger essential oil just put in tea or food or, or like as a meal prep thing? When, when I think of something like that, what comes to mind is travel. I think taking those little bottles along when you travel is great because you can't always get a uh, fresh squeezed lemon in your tea. You can't even get the ginger. So again, MacGyvering it, taking those things along and putting a couple drops in is great. Just know to use high quality, you know, sustainable goods, not, you know, cheap versions with a lot of alcohol thrown in there. You know, you always want the highest quality um, procured from a, a good reputable source. And again, consult with someone who knows about essential oils before you start dabbling in it. You know, we can read so much online. People ask each other on Facebook, what should I do? I'm, I'm reading about moms asking about, you know, asking their fellow moms on Facebook, what should I do? My son's stomach hurts. I, I don't advise that because what might work for one person well, for another, and they might not know that certain things are contraindicated for you or your family member that you're asking about. So I would ask a professional and stick with one person, not a bunch of different people. Just stick with one, commit to that, work with it for a while. And then if it's not working, then maybe move on. But don't get caught up in asking 10 different people questions. It's not good. Right. That's important. You brought up a good point. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, just people's opinion, it's better to ask a professional who is experienced with essential oils. Right. right. Um, do you actually use that to diffuse in the class or just to use yourself just for aromatherapy wise or massage? Because I know, I think, and you right, it's a focus on a lot of um, using different oils. I think, I think essential oils are great and diffusers are great if everyone in the room is okay with it, but sometimes you know, not everyone's liver loves that oil that you have going on in the diffuser and they'll get nauseous or something. So I tend to not work too much with that. I have in the past, especially if I walk into the room. Uh, one time I had a little studio space for a couple of years and it would kind of just smell a little stale when I went in there. It was in an office building. So I would turn the diffuser on, get it going, and then shut it off when people came into class. And that seemed to work well. A little residual essence of something but not full-blown pouring out into the room during class but it's fine if everyone else is fine with it um what about for detoxifying and purifying like the air and stuff like that do you like use any type of um smog or some sort of like sage or whatever for the house or you know 
Uh, you know, in terms of, of clearing, as we, we like to say, you want to clear, like I just moved into a, you know, a home that's new to me. There were previous people living here. So I'm finishing unpacking and a friend gave me these sticks of Palo Santo, which is great for clearing. And I really like the smell of it. I tend to be sensitive around a lot of the essential oils and, and different different sages and things. I, my olfactory sense is through the roof. I, I'm like a bloodhound. I smell things. So if it's, if it's something that's too, doesn't agree with me, I won't use it, but the Palo Santo really resonates with me. I love the smell of it. So yes, definitely using something. And there are different ways of going about the ritual of clearing the room that you can read about. But really, if you're putting just good intention into it and you're just throwing out Om Namah Shivaya or a little short chant to Ganesha to remove obstacles, as long as the, the heartfelt intention is there, it works. You know, it's as the saying goes, where focus goes, energy flows. It doesn't have to be, you know, some long drawn out thing. So you mentioned a couple of chants. So um, can you repeat them again and um, share what they mean? Well, sometimes it's hard to transliterate certain Sanskrit words. But for instance, I just said Om Namah Shivaya. So Om being the primordial, primordial sound from which you know everything comes from. Nama or Namaha is... Uh, essentially means that you're offering up whatever you're saying in reference to your highest good. And then Shiva or Shivaya is uh, one of the, the deities. So Om Namah Shivaya, as it's been taught to me, basically means thy will be done, thy with a capital T, thy again being whatever your highest good is. If you think of it as God, God's energy, source, spirit, whatever your, your highest goodness is, thy will be done, you know, the, may the best be done. And I'm offering this up in, in reverence to everything good. Oh, okay. So you mentioned one, for some reason, I thought you mentioned two. And then, and then I mentioned a uh, short oh. chant to Ganesha. Ganesha is that cute little pot bellied elephant headed deity who's known to remove obstacles and and even more so what he's known to do is close some doors and open others so when a door closes in your life a chapter in your life may end you may be sad or angry thinking oh this is not good but it's often good you know go with the flow because then the next door is going to go open and it might be even better than what you had before so a short chant to ganesha might be om gum ganapate namaha Om, again, the primordial sound. Gum is Ganesha's little, what we call bija mantra, little seed sound. Om gum ganapateye is another way of saying Ganesha. Om gum ganapateye namaha, offering it up. Again, offering it up with your highest good. So those are, those are good standbys <laughs> to go with. Beautiful, I like those. Yeah. Yeah. Um. As for the, um, hmm. <laughs> your, so let's go back to the um, morning routine again. So you, you mentioned, you know, going to bed about 10 between basically sleep, the, go to bed by 10 and then wake up by the latest six. Yes. And after you wake up, um, you said you have your tea, you have tea and um, like what other things do you do? Do you do practice, uh, eat breakfast and you know, what other things? Right, so I'll, I'll rise by six. If I get out of bed after that, I'll feel cobwebby. That's when you know, we say the kapha starts to set in, the, the heaviness of the earth and water elements of which kapha are made up. They will start to set in and, and you won't have that get up and go or at least I don't. So I like to rise. Of course, I'll go in and do the usual, uh, empty my bladder, brush the teeth, scrape the tongue. And then I do practice, a, a dinacharya practice called abhyangam, 
which is taking usually warmed oil, except in summer, you don't really need to warm the oil. And there are various oils you use for the different times of year. And again, your own personal needs. Take the oil and in long strokes on the body, massage it into the skin, use nice circular motions on your joints, your face, your scalp, everywhere. You can just Ayurveda and oil go hand in hand. The oil goes everywhere on and in the body with Ayurveda. So I'll do the Abhyangam, then go into the kitchen, get the tea going, uh, drink a lot of water because I'm going into the, the drier stage of life. I'm entering into the, I'm a Pitta person, but I'm going into the Vata stage of life where you know I'll be drying out more. So I'm taking in a lot more water these days, drink the tea, and then I'll sit down on the mat and that's where I do my practice, which largely for me is pranayama and meditation. Asana is great, but it's not my main focus. I'm very physical, I love exercise, so I exercise, stretch. Uh, I do asana with my clients, but I don't, for the most part, do much asana based soul practice some few things but mainly main focus is pranayama and meditation and then i go about my day okay that's a good routine mm -hmm. um so for your uh the oils can you list some examples of the oils and when to use which type so again for instance we're in summer right now we're in pitta season and Basically, coconut oil is good to use in summer for it has a more cooling energy, cooling effect. Energy in Ayurveda in terms of hot and cold is, is known as the virya, virya. So that you look at the virya of a substance, it's heating or cooling qualities. And of course, in summer, you don't want to use a heating oil, you'll use a cooling oil. So coconut oil comes into play. Some people find that too heavy or maybe there's a, an allergy of some kind. So an alternative oil might be sunflower oil. And again, you always wanna source high quality as minimally processed products as possible. You wanna look for uh, the word unrefined on it, you know, and you can find good quality. You can go right into the grocery store, right into the food aisle and just make sure it's organic and unrefined. Or of course, there are you know other places you can source it. So summer would be coconut or or sunflower. As we go into winter, the very popular oil to use is sesame oil. Okay, but you can also mix it. If, if a person's very dry, what we run into sometimes, and I ran into this when I first started practicing years ago, was I was very dry and I was putting the sesame oil on, but still feeling dry. And it was brought to my attention that maybe I was so dry that my skin was like a desert and the sesame oil was like a, a pouring rain, a flash flood effect coming in. So the oil was just running over my skin, not really penetrating because sesame oil tends to be thicker. So I started working with almond oil or mixing almond oil with the sesame or jojoba with the sesame. So again, you can MacGyver it to your needs. But sesame oil is the, the known winter oil. And it has a good antibacterial effect and is a good carrier oil for the essential oils that you talked about or other herbs that get cooked in for different imbalances. Springtime, a person might not use an oil. They might just dry brush the body if they tend to have a more cuffa quality to their skin, a, a nice, moist, natural quality. We, we call that person... Um, Meda Sara, Meda being the, the, the skin or, you know, part of the body. They have Sara, their skin is of good quality. They're Meda Sara. So they might just do dry brushing in the spring because they tend to feel already very watery and lubricate. They don't want to over lubricate. Wow. Interesting. Because um, I don't know if you can tell, like I'm, I'm the dry skin type. And you can, I can tell you that you use a lot of oils. So you're more like smooth <laughs> like with the with the oils on your skin i'm probably also having a hot flash in the moment so it's probably a little bit of perspiration going on mixed in with coconut oil <laughs> but yeah i use i i use a lot of oil i need to use a lot of oil it's it's a mainstay in my dinacharya for sure yeah um uh so 
how um, I've heard that coconut oil, if you use too much, it can have an opposite effect. It could be drying. Is that true? I've been hearing that too. And uh, maybe, you know, for some people, again, things can have uh, different effects. You know, it could have an unusual effect. So and we call that in Ayurveda that when a substance is typically known to do one thing, but you know, can have a special effect, or maybe in this case, a negative effect, but the special effect would be called the prabhava. Something may have a prabhava for doing something that it's, that it's typically intended for, it might do something else. Or maybe a person's imbalance, their current state, their vikruti or their doshic imbalance causes a reaction of dryness. Um, again, you have to see what works for you. Maybe it's a little bit too thick for someone. And again, it's not penetrating their skin. So maybe mix it with another oil. Uh, someone gave me an oil recently that's a mixture of coconut and jojoba. So that seems to be working. That's going into my skin well. Jojoba has a little bit more, is a little bit more of an astringent oil. That sounds like an oxymoron, oil being astringent. But again, these substances have different qualities. So maybe mixing that thinner, lighter oil in with the thicker coconut oil is a good balance. You just have to always, people are coming to me all the time saying they heard this, they read that. And I always say the bottom line is to do it and see how you feel. Eat the food, see how you feel. Someone who's vata might come to me, has a vata imbalance, might say, oh, I heard I'm not supposed to have X food. Well, eat it and see how you feel. There are some things that are obviously not good for anyone at any time with all the junk food out there, but other things, eat it, see how you feel. You might have an effect while you're eating it and then there's a post-digestive effect afterwards. Just eat it and, and notice what you notice or do it and notice what you notice. So you mentioned a lot of um, terms and different ways to do things. Um, so what are some of the book recommendations that you give for uh, listeners? Uh, anything by Dr. Vasant Lad, of course. He's our foremost leader in Ayurveda, as well as other, other uh, doctors, Ayurvedic physicians and practitioners. Uh, but I love Dr. Lad. His approach keeps you interested. He has a, a very... He just has a, a really wonderful approach. I, it's not even possible for me to put into words how he is. And then I also love Dr. John Duyard's teachings because he really has a way of being able to address the lay person in a way that they can understand all this Ayurvedic terminology. He may not even always use the terminology. He'll put it into lay terms so that we can really, again, digest and assimilate it into ourselves in a way that's good. Um, Dr. Claudia Welch is well known for her Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine approach on women's lives, transitions, health issues. So many good, great teachers out there. My own personal, one of my own personal teachers worked at Dr. Lod's Institute years ago and she is now based in France. Her name is Michelle Schultz. If ever you want to uh, experience the embodiment of vata exuberance coupled with pitta precision and the, the kapha really loving, giving qualities of teachings in Ayurvedic food and yoga, all sorts of things, you'll want to do something with Michelle Schultz for sure. So there are a few right there. Thank you for the recommendations. Um, for for somebody who just starting and wanting to learn more about it, what are the, some of the few first few changes to start with? Going back again to Dinacharya, if you're going to bed really late, let's say you're a one a.m. person, my advice is always to don't go to any extremes. Ayurveda is not an extreme practice. It doesn't take dogmatic or fanatical approaches. So I'd say if you're going to bed at 1 a.m., start cutting back to 12.30 or midnight. And then just work back in increments every couple of weeks. Make sure the lights are out by X time. And then the next couple of weeks, go back a little bit more. 
work on turning off all your technology, all your lights, computer, music, phone, a good hour before bed so that you can start to take it down a notch. Don't eat late. So go and, and then eventually work back to going to bed by 10. You won't have to set an alarm to get up at six because as you start to go to bed earlier, you'll start to naturally rise earlier. It's a, it's a much more gentle approach to things. It's not a, so much of a shock on the body, but that's not to say that if you don't have an acute situation, you might need to go a little bit, you know, more intensely at it to, you know, if something dangerous is going on, you, you, you don't have the, the luxury of time to go very slowly. You might have to hit it hard in the beginning. And then once you get under control, again, do things well, we say at least 50% of the time. But again, if you are working with something really dangerous, you might have to go hard, like, you know, 80 or 100% so that you can get out of pain and suffering and danger and then work your way back to 50, 60. I like to hover at like 70, 75% of doing that things. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so to wrap up everything, um, what's your biggest takeaway from your experience as a student and as a teacher and moving forward? As a student, you know, seek out qualified teachers, uh, keep your ears open more than your mouth because that's how information comes in through the ears, not when you're speaking yourself. You know, you can ask questions, but, and just be open-minded. Some of us like me, for instance, I'm very Pitta predominant and Pitta always wants to know why. So when I started learning, I was, why this, why that? And then what I really loved about Ayurveda was as I went along and practiced it, I noticed that it worked. So I, you know, it proved to me that it worked. I didn't need to know why anymore. So now I don't ask why. There's a saying, you know, if you say why, the response is, it is so, right? You just know that it works if you practice it. You know, a lot of people come for consultations and it's what I call a one-off. They come, they are excited about doing it. They come for the initial consult and then that's it. They, they fall off the wagon. They don't come back for their follow-ups because maybe it's not the right time. They're not prepared to, to do the work or be the active participant. They just want to pop the pill and be done with it. But if you do it, it will work. Ayurveda works, but you have to participate. So. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. You learn a lot, and I'm sure the listeners will learn a lot. And I'll have everything in the description. So, yeah. Okay. Be well and enjoy your Ayurvedic studies. Thank you. Okay. Bye.